G'day guys, Luke McElroy from Mets Performance Consulting. Welcome back to another episode of the VCE PE podcast, number one for 2023. And as such, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to discuss the 2022 PE exam. And to do so, I've got two very special guests today in Michael Woolhouse and Paul Stockdale from ABC PE. Welcome, gents. Thank you, mate. Good evening. Guys, for those not familiar with ABC PE, uh, they are geniuses at the VCE PE study design. They are exam markers. They're teachers themselves currently teaching VCE PE, have a lot of resources, a lot of free content, um, and they're just very, very good in the space, but keep things very, very simple, which is why I like to work with them, because we have uh, very similar philosophies when we look at VCE PE. So I wanted just to start, we are going to go through a few questions which students really struggled with in the 2022 exam. But before we do, gents, uh, whoever wants to go, give us a quick summary uh, of of your thoughts on the exam and, and maybe what you sort of noticed whilst um, whilst reviewing and, and marking the exams and, and if anything's ever changed since the, uh, since the, the, what am I saying? The, <laughs> I've gone totally blank. The no, examiner's report. Sorry. I'm not going to edit that either guys. I don't edit these podcasts. So it's, uh, it is purely live and one take. So give us a quick overview. Uh, maybe stockers start, start you off, mate. Well, we were discussing earlier, um, Luke, that probably there's a couple of areas that still continue to challenge students, biomechanics being one, and this exam was biomechanics heavy. There was quite some large um, questions, uh, a lot of marks in biomechanics. Uh, the other one was interplay. Um, we've done some stats on on interplay responses, and we really haven't improved as a profession in teaching um, interplay so that our students understand. Um, we're probably sitting over the last, or well, since 2018, when we looked at the stats, um, we're sitting at about 40% of the marks for interplay, and we haven't been able to improve that. So I think that's a concern, and we probably want to focus on that a little bit. Willie, you were looking at some positives as well earlier, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So there's always some positives. Multi-choice, um, the state nailed, which is really good. There was no question less than 50% correct on multi-choice. So I guess that might... Um, lend itself to in classroom when might be practicing multi-choice more you can do that really quickly and easily so it probably gives us a good indication that if we are practicing stuff in class in terms of question structure how to answer we're probably getting better at that in the actual exam too skill act we're good at um, I think as long as we continue to use proper terminology so um, with skill act show off our knowledge so use your definitions use PE terminology that was a big win. Um, passive and active recovery. Again, year after year, we do pretty well what we, the state does pretty well at that. Um, so there's definitely some positives, but as you said, yeah, a couple of things that we want to get better at for sure. Yeah, it certainly seemed like it was some of those application style questions, those real prac heavy, if, if that's the right terminology, um, type of questions where students struggled. So let's jump straight in. Let's start with energy system interplay because I know that is a, a recurring issue for students. Uh, Woolley, do you want to take us through 1C and then we'll introduce 11B as well? But we're going to start with those energy system questions. So talk about 1C for me, mate. Nice one. So 1C is what we would call your classic rate question, where you've got two events that are swam at different speeds and you've got to be able to um, understand and demonstrate your knowledge that you know what's going on. So really, we need to do these in our sacks and in our schools. Swimming is a, a little bit harder, but if we can do 50-metre sprint versus 400-metre sprint in our sacks, this should help our students really understand this. How we um, try and simplify it for our kids is we use the acronym I definitely rate you, I-D-R-Y, and we want them to begin their energy system interplays. We're certainly not the best at this. I'll be asking Mon Sharp about energy system interplay all day, every day. But I definitely rate you is how we want our kids to answer this. And I for intensity, D for duration, R for rate, Y for yield. If they use that as the basis of their um, answering technique, I reckon they're going to be able to access more marks than most of the state. So only 3% of the state could get six out of six for this one. And yes, it's interplay, but I guess it's probably on the relatively easier scale of interplay and, and we'll have a look at the tougher one later on. So if you do this in your schools, and then you assess it in your sacks. I reckon that's going to hopefully help you a lot. And then starting with intensity, duration, rate, and yield, all these energy, that's that's the language that VCARs seem to be looking for. Um, so the 400 metre is a longer duration. The 200 metre is higher intensity. 
which means there's going to be obviously those great energy system contributions from the faster energy systems, faster rate, faster speed. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary. I'm just looking at uh, on the examiner's report, um, you know, why students did well or, or poorly and like 2.7 average for a six mark question. And, and it, it should be a fairly straightforward one, as you said, one's longer and one's shorter. And, and it's just about putting the right information in it. As you said, it has, has the rate and the yield and it's saying that the, the shorter event has more contribution from the anaerobic systems. It didn't even necessarily specify which ones. Like you said, the anaerobic systems have a faster rate, but a lower yield. As the duration increases, well, there's going to be a more heavy reliance on the aerobic energy system, which is a slower rate with a higher yield. So you're going to be slower. And that's all you had to say, really. The, the, the shorter event is going to be a faster time or a faster, faster mm. average speed than is the longer event. So um, I think it just comes down to, and it's always that, you know, a lot of students going with that generic energy system interplay of, you know, all three systems are always active and the first 10 yeah. seconds is ATP and then it's uh, so on and so forth. And it's, I think it comes out every single year that just be specific, use the data and, and you can still open. Are you guys comfortable with opening with a general statement saying that, you know, all three energy systems are active in this, in, in the 200 and the 400 meter race? Yeah, no problem. Then you've got to be super specific after that. Like just use the data that's there. Absolutely. And, and you want to separate those continuous interplay questions with those intermittent sports because the amount of those generic answers that come through is still really huge, like big number. And Stockies was talking about before, but 2018, 2.7 was the average. And that was a, on skiing interplay. 2022, 2.7 is the average. So we as teachers haven't got better at this. We haven't found the secret yet. That's on us, I guess, as teachers to get better, to improve. This is the one thing that we can guarantee is on the exam. Mm. Yet we still don't, we still haven't seen much improvement over the last few years or no improvement. I really like the way that you explained it, that the the longer duration event is going to get a greater contribution from the aerobic system. Um, and that system has the slowest rate of them all, which means that the average pace is always going to be slower. The more ATP you get from that slowest system, um, what some students, and I remember marking the exam, many students were explaining that um, PC would deplete and as PC depleted, the anaerobic glycolysis system would become the greatest contributor. And then as that depleted, the aerobic system would become the greatest contributor. And, and that shows a misunderstanding because that system doesn't deplete. It's simply that the aerobic system or the duration of the event has allowed for sufficient oxygen to reach the muscle. And so the aerobic system becomes the greatest contributor, which has the slowest rate. Yeah, and I think what I like about the suggested answer, which if you can just pull it up on the, uh, don't do it now, stalkers, but those playing from home can just pull it up, the examiner's report. But it, it's just, um, it, you don't need to go into that whole script of, you know, after 10 seconds, the PC will mostly deplete and you have an increased contribution from anaerobic glide till 60 to 75. It's just not necessary. It's very succinct. It says that the shorter events will, be, will have a, more heavy reliance on the anaerobic energy systems, the longer event's going to be more on the aerobic. Like that, that's not scripted. That's just using what's there. You've got a 200 versus a 400. And then all you're doing is explaining why and, and applying your knowledge. So I don't think I've ever seen an exam question that where you would follow that that really succinct script of 10 seconds to 60 to 75. You, you just yeah. sort of have to it's use almost, what's there. It's almost perfect completely, isn't it? And it would be almost, so. we need to start again and just be like, Done. Get the times out. Get the times out. Yeah. yeah, because we haven't gotten better. Like, no times. Absolutely. It's a be you're going to have better success, I reckon, with no times at all because then they actually have to understand it instead of just, just learning it. Because as you say, we overcomplicate these things a lot. It's like it's a shorter race, more anaerobic, faster rate, faster swimmer. Beautiful. And you're going to get above state average. You can just say that. So... So, Willie, you were talking about, um, you, you use, um, I definitely rate you. I heard the other day one of my students using eye dry um, as in intensity, duration, rate, and yield. If we flick to 11B, which is another energy systems interplay question, and you look in the first line of that question, it says um, that we need to analyze the interplay of energy systems in relation to intensity and duration. So, you know, VK are signposting that we must use this language um luke what were your thoughts on on this question yeah and i think that's an interesting point and it might be something i throw back to you guys and can we just go to that question now on your screen stockers so that people at home can see and, and i should have mentioned this guys if you're listening to this podcast we will also have a video link it'll be in the description of the podcast so if you'd rather watch this and see our screens as we go um feel free to, to find that too 
But yeah, yeah. I, I think because you've got obviously a six mark question for 1C and then you've got an eight mark question for 11B. Um, a lot of people, and we get the question a lot, like what do you have to say in an energy system interplay question? And if it specifically says rate and yield, then that's obviously a, a giveaway. But then even in in 1C, it might not, I can't remember, does it specifically say rate or yield? I don't think it does, but you've got the times and you've got the duration. So we we have to we have to reference rate and yield because you're talking about different energy systems. So it's kind of implied in the answer, but yeah, definitely. If it specifically says rate and yield, that's a giveaway to to um, to mention it. So I'm just looking through what. So the question here. Um, so analyze the interplay of the three energy systems in relation to intensity and duration of the trial runner for the data provided. In your response, include the role of acute responses of the cardiovascular system and respiratory system in the provision. So you look basically. And this is without me looking at what's written on the um, examiner's report. And feel free to jump in, gents. But 64 minutes long. So aerobic energy system here. That's the major contributor. So we need to say that. And then you can see some increases in heart rate. So whenever there's an increase in heart rate, we're going to talk about an oxygen deficit. It's only temporary, but an oxygen deficit, and therefore an increased reliance on the anaerobic glycolysis system. We don't need to reference the PC ATP PC system in there because it, you can see there's no periods of passive recovery. We're always moving. You can mention it at the start for sure very very briefly but you're not going to spend any other time on it because you don't have any passive recoveries throughout and then i think the key here i think um was to to just link this to some acute responses so when you're saying that um, we have an increased contribution from anaerobic glycolysis if you say because of an oxygen deficit which which is basically a lag in your heart rate and your um, stroke volume and your ventilation and your pulmonary diffusion increasing there's ticking the box for the for the um for the acute responses as well so it's just really having a well-rounded knowledge of not just talking energy system interplay, but then when you link an increased contribution from anaerobic glide due to oxygen deficit, just mention that we have to increase the heart rate. We have to increase all the other acute responses. And I think there's quite a, a lengthy um, example answer, but that's all they did. And they just described what happened from zero to 64 minutes um, and then explained the increase in heart rate and linked that to both an oxygen deficit and, and therefore an increased contribution from anaerobic glide. Mm. And if you ask students, uh, just, you know, in talking to them, what's a cardiovascular acute response? I mean, they can name them so easy. Same with respiratory. So that's just about putting them in there. And the way you introduce that major contributing system first up, overall duration, that's a mark already. So you've, you've already in the game, increased heart rate, increased anaerobic systems, regardless of the sport. So I reckon that's a better way to go through. Anyway, sorry, Stoppy. No, I really like the way too, Luke, that you, you um, it, when you were explaining that, that you referred to the fact that um, those oxygen deficits later in the event are going to come from the anaerobic glycolysis system because there hasn't been passive rest, which means the PC system has been depleted for all intents and uh, purposes. Um, that was something that came across on the examiner's day, that, that, that they would like to see that in there, that understanding that this is a continuous event. And so PC will deplete and there's no opportunity for it to replenish. Now, that's a differentiating factor from an intermittent interplay mm. question from a sport such as, you know, uh, an intermittent sport such as netball or basketball or football where there is that passive rest. So it's a nice way to differentiate the continuous and the intermittent interplay responses. And I think I think in terms of energy system interplay, and I, I want to move on to the next question, but... The, the continuous ones are the the easier ones to, to answer in, in terms of any continuous event longer than 60 seconds. We know the aerobic energy system is going to be the major contributor and it will remain that way. And all you're doing here is, is explaining the ups and the downs in the heart rate. Um, and it's probably a discussion for, for another day. And we sort of mentioned it a little bit already, but I think where students lack is an eight mark question versus a six mark question. I've seen a four mark question before is, is like, what do you, how do you write it? What do you put in there? Like, that's a lot of lines. I'm looking at that. That's a lot of lines to, to put some stuff in um, and the, the example answer is quite long, but it, it, it still is just explaining what's happening. You know, what's the major contributor and why, and then how do you explain the ups and downs using energy systems and acute responses? That's all, it's all it's having in there, but it still looks like an overwhelming amount to write. And I think that's where students maybe um, lose quite a few marks. That's why if you can intensity duration rate and yield, if you can sort of begin as that, that can be a little anchor point and, and then, Hopefully that takes away a little bit of that fear factor from it. Let's move back um, because we wanted to go over some biomechanics. So we identified that energy systems interplay um, is something that we as a profession just need to um, improve with our teaching. But I think um, biomechanics also, and I and look, we hear from many teachers um, at this time of the year who have a little anxiety around the best way 
to teach biomechanics. And um, I cannot put this any plainer. It's got to be done with PRAC. PRAC, PRAC, PRAC is the easiest way for students to be able to understand the theory. And it's interesting because I think kids inherently understand the application of biomechanics. They get it. What they don't get is the theory. Um, they, they get the application, but not the theory. So it's our job to try and put those two together. But let's start with what they understand. So um, to see uh, the principles of summation of momentum, this is a four mark question. So VCAR are looking for, for four pieces of information. Um, in order to teach this, um, we will use the stock standard throw with the wrist, throw with the elbow and wrist, throw with the shoulder, elbow and wrist, throw. And so you're just bringing in more parts the whole time and the kids will see for themselves, well, hang on, I can throw further if I get a run up, use my legs, um, use my torso, use my shoulder. They can see it all um, and realize very quickly, okay, I can use more body parts. Well, that would have got you a mark. If you use as many body parts as possible, you use the bigger or the heavier and the slower body parts first, such as the legs, the hips, the trunk, and move the sequence to the lighter but faster body parts and the fastest body part of it all should be the, the hand in the throw, um, then you're going to get a greater distance. Now, that's two marks already. And the third and fourth mark is going to come from stabilisation and finally correct timing. And Woolley and I for many years have used this um, hack we say when we think for summation, think best. B, body parts. E is for sequence. Now, that's a bit dodgy, but it's the second letter in sequence. And believe it or not, it makes sense to the kids. S is for stabilisation. T is for timing. So think best for for summation. Another one that we think is awesome is to throw right hand, which or dominant hand, and then throw non-dominant hand and video it. And the kids can see how unstable they are when they throw with their non-dominant hand. So there's a few little um, practical tips that I would use to teach that. I think I think with that one, I think, as you said, people will go into the able to, every student knows what they need to do to throw the ball faster. And it's just putting that in paper. And, and that's almost the op polar opposite of the energy system question. Like you almost do have to almost just remember the things that make up for summation. You need to have a stable base, big body parts, first small body parts at the end follow through so you're not negatively accelerating at the end of the activity. Like those types of things, we know that's what we do, but we do have to just remember that, all right, they're what you know VCAR want for the exam for that specific question. And it's the same with this one. Um, I mean, look, if we'd gone out and played volleyball uh, as part of our prac, uh, I think students would have absolutely nailed both of these questions. Um, the, the projectile motion one, um, this lady is is jumping up high, okay. So she's increasing her height of release. Why? What 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 effect does that have on the other three? It's a projectile motion question. So we've got to be hitting three things: height, angle, velocity of release. In my opinion, right. So if we manipulate the height by jumping, what does that do to the other two? Well, it should theoretically reduce the angle, and we're still able to get the ball over the net because that's the objective here get the ball over the net, down into the court on the opposite side, increase the height, I can decrease the angle. And if I can decrease the angle, that means I can increase the velocity to as fast as possible, still get the ball over the net and into the opposition's court, which makes it very hard to defend. Whereas this person, lower height of release, that means their angle goes up and that means that the speed needs to come down. Now, if you'd played volleyball, if you'd played quits, if you'd played hooky in your class, I think that the kids understand this um, a lot better and can probably respond to any question in the exam. Uh, yeah, I think, Stocky, sorry, we're just with biomechanics, like stay in your lane, I think is very good advice for this in terms of with those servers, we could talk about impulse, we could talk about Newton's laws, we could talk about so many biomechanical principles, but VCAR has been super kind to us over the years where it says... It gives us very clearly the biomechanical principle they want us to talk about. So here, yes, impulse would be important, but it's not relevant to this answer in particular. So stay in your lane really clearly. If we're talking about projectile, 
and you just got to know HIV. If you're talking about impulse, it's force and type, whatever. But don't, and as we teach these concepts, don't muddy the waters a little bit. Um, I'd say, yeah, teach them separately first. So then what, you're, together. I th- what you're suggesting, if we went and played volleyball, just focus on projectile motion. Mm-hmm. Don't try and bring it all in whilst you're teaching it. Early, absolutely. Then when we're in swap back or when we're revising, then we can say, all right, what's here, what's here, what's there. But the first time they hear it, I definitely reckon stay in that lane for sure. Yeah. Um, this this one here, I think, is a, just a, a difficult question. Um, and it wasn't done particularly well. But again, you, you know, if, if you are up the front of a class and you get a student to come and, and try and spike a ball or perform a long jump or something like that, you'll notice straight away that one arm goes back and, and the legs go back as well. Well, that wouldn't have got you the mark. Right? However, if we think of this in terms of rotation, um, it makes a bit of sense when you see that this arm comes back in that direction. Right? So that's a clockwise direction, whereas the legs come back in that direction, which is an anti-clockwise. So whilst they might come back and back, which you go, oh, hang on, that's not an equal and opposite. The fact that one's going clockwise whilst the other one's going anti-clockwise, that would have got you the mark all day, every day. So it's a little bit about terminology and those angular laws. Most of us don't teach a lot or spend a lot of time teaching those angular laws. It's not examined a lot. Last year it was. Mind you, that's probably the only example I use throughout the whole year as well, Stock, because it's always that. It's the, the upper body's going um, anti-clockwise, the lower body's going clockwise. So it's almost one that you should just just add it to your arsenal. Just teach that specific example because I think that's the only one I really teach as well. And sure enough, that was the one that was on that that exam, just the way it was. Because yeah, there's not going to be too many because it is a pretty tricky one to to wrap your head around. Otherwise, agreed, mate. Um, all right, we're going to skip to three B, I believe. Um, Did you want to I... quickly talk on four C soccer's? I, I remember Wooly wanted to mention something about four C. I can't remember oh, the terminology yeah. you used. Mate, really good point. Well, do you want to take that? I think we're talking yeah. about making sure that students signpost, yeah? So th- this in, was a tough one to mark because we had to give so many zeros out of four because even for kids who had really good understanding of these concepts, and the reason they got zero which is they didn't use this key terminology that's asked for here in terms of um, frequency, intensity, time and type. So a lot of kids were saying, um, what are we... We're doing power, aren't we? So, yeah, so 50% 1RM is in the correct um, resistance level for power. And it's like, well, you understand this content, but you're not getting the full mask. You have to say the intensity is correct because 50% 1RM is the correct um, range for power. So the word intensity is super important. Same with time, same with type. If you didn't put those in, you just weren't getting those full marks. So it was really, in terms of the stats, there was a big 44% of people got zero where really in terms of understanding we were way higher than that, but that's just exam technique. Make sure you signpost. And we've got to do that in our sacks too. Mark your sacks like that. Make sure they're using those terminology, that terminology. Very good. Let's uh, jump back to 3B quickly, Selkers, and then we'll move on to number six after that. So 3B, um, I, was, I was, to be honest, I was disappointed this was, wasn't answered well because we talk about this a lot in our sessions, at least in uh, Term 3 and 4, when we talk about chronic adaptations. Three, Can you get 3B up on that Next screen? One, stop you. Yeah, there you go. that's it. Uh, and it was to do with ventilation. So it was um, during submaximal exercise, it is possible for trained aerobic athletes to have a lower ventilation than untrained individuals. And then it was explained how this is possible. I think all we have to say was that uh, it, it's possible because uh, we can have a higher AVO. Uh, so you can, it says here you can say AVO to difference or pulmonary diffusion. I'd be saying pulmonary diffusion, but you can sort of link either, I suppose. But an increased pulmonary diffusion means you can uh, more efficiently diffuse oxygen into the bloodstream and therefore not breathe as much ventilation, like I simply put. And I think where students got confused was they they started the the chain the mechanical changes. So they said that you could you know you could um, reduce your respiratory rate but that's not going to happen. Like that's it's still going to be the same ventilation overall. So whether you change, your, if your respiratory rate goes down, your tidal volume will just go up, but your ventilation will be the same unless you're purposely trying to breathe less. But um, the body's going to maintain that same oxygen consumption. I think that's the key is that 
even if we, I'm not going to use cardiac output as an example, even if you look at cardiac output, that's going to be about the same. Let's forget AVO2 difference changes. Let's just isolate cardiac output. That's going to be the same for a trained versus an untrained. But we know that a trained person has a higher stroke volume and therefore has a lower heart rate. And, and that's all this question is doing here, but we can't isolate tidal volume and respiratory rate. We have to say ventilation. So if the question was the same thing, a, a cardiac output, well, it, it's it's going to be, a, the only way that cardiac output would be lower is if AVO2 difference goes higher. Now, I know I'm talking a lot of concepts, but we come back to ventilation. Well, ventilation, how can you breathe less air in? Well, the only way you can breathe less air in is if you're extracting more oxygen because you need the same oxygen consumption regardless. It doesn't really matter how fit you are. Like yeah, the tiny changes based on, you know, um, your diaphragm, um, oxygen costs and all that sort of stuff. But whether you're fit or unfit, you're going to need about the same oxygen consumption at the same workload. So how can you have the same oxygen consumption, but breathe less air? That's what it's basically asking. Same oxygen consumption, less air. Well, you must be diffusing more of that oxygen out of the air you're breathing. And that's that increase in pulmonary diffusion. So um, I would have actually, to, to be honest, I don't know if it make much difference. I would love to have a an actual graph on there just to show it but yeah i think it's just a i know your students probably struggle a little bit too guys just because it's probably something you don't really talk about you just talk about the mechanics of tidal volume and respiratory rate and you don't really touch on how would this graph change pre and post training we try and keep Absolutely it correct. so i teach it exactly the same as q equals sv times hr um and then my students weren't able to to see that efficiency link unfortunately so that that's a learning for me i'll be i'll be teaching it in future yeah, but I've, I've just learned from you explaining that, mate. And we're always learning. We're certainly not the experts. And I was always, well, why doesn't why is cardiac output say the same? Because that's a fairly common exam question. Re, uh, trained versus untrained, have a look at their cardiac output and how. But that, um, you need the same O2, but you can just breathe less air. I've written it down and I'm beautiful. Now I know. So thank you. Well, so that's the cardiac output. It, it, it may stay, like, it will stay the same unless your AVO2 difference goes up. Because we know yeah. VO2 max is your cardiac output times by your AVO2 yeah, difference. Yeah. So it's just that, that's just another part of the equation. One goes up, the other goes down. So yeah. oh, you almost have to write out all the possible scenarios. Yeah. And it's a lot of up arrows and down arrows. It's like impulse yeah. as well, isn't it? Force and time. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I think even to get one mark there, I think your students just said that um, the more trained athlete can use oxygen more efficiently. I think that's still a mark. And then if you can link that to either pulmonary diffusion or AVO2 difference, that was the second mark. So yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. 0.3 being the average, let's try at least get a one out of that, you know? So I was just about to say that. And and I got the only rule that I've really in, enforced strictly at, at school is no blanks. Please never put a blank in any of your sacks. Write me a joke if you have to, because 75% of people got zero for that one. So if you can get eke out one just by saying something like more efficiently, well, you're ahead of 80%. How good's that? You, you're doing really well. So um, have a crack, definitely. Yeah, I don't mind that. Like, we, I had a, a biomechanics session, like an introductory one, the other day, and we we're talking about stability. And, and one of the ones, one of the parts of stability is base of support. And the kids go, "Oh, uh, greater surface area." And I'm like, "Yeah, cl not, not yeah, close enough." It's the same concept. It's not the right terminology, but it gives you a chance at getting the mark um, by saying the right type of thing, um, and you're at least showing that you guys, as exam markers, that you you know what you're talking about. You just yeah. maybe don't necessarily know that the correct terminology that is expected. And and like human nature, I guess, is to try and reward the people that, that have a crack. And, and I don't know, like we've got a strict marking guide and all that sort of stuff, but if we can't give a mark for a blank, but you might be able to sneak one out for, for some writing for sure. All right. Well, um, another one that we were going to look at was a biomechanics question, 9D. Oh, hang on. Before I go past question six, Willie, you were a little disappointed in 6A, were you not? Yeah, a little bit, yeah, because we had, um, for 6A, we had 43% of people get zero, and I think the most, most people chose this as an anaerobic capacity test. Um, but still, even with the definition, we only had 17% get two out of two. I reckon this is on the lower order scale. It just means kids have to nail definitions, and us as teachers have to expose our kids as much as possible to these tests, because if they're doing a yo-yo test, yeah, there's going to be those increased anaerobic contributions at the end. But due to that duration of the test, hopefully they can all understand if they've run it, that it's, we're testing our, our aerobic power. So I think just probably the lesson here is if we can, I know we've got, we're busy and all that sort of stuff, but prac is invaluable for our kids. And one, it's fun. Two, 
they learn much better and we can actually save time in the classroom, I think anyway, if we can do more prac because we don't have to go through the content so um, extensively. I think that um, many students who choose to do PE do so because they love moving. Um, and I would suggest that probably equates to a lot of kinesthetic learners sitting in our classes. So if we can get those kids outside and doing, that just could be the key to their understanding. And, and it's also going to cover the course, I think, in more, in more detail. So again, Wooly, you've hit the nail on the head. Just get out and do these things if you can. It's not always easy, I understand. Um, we're probably fortunate that we work at schools with great facilities and we can get out as often as we can. Hey, go. mate, just, just nick back to 6CI. It's just worth very quickly saying, and this is something that we can try and implement at, um, in our school. So we all, most of us do the beat test, which we all consider the beat test, um, in our fitness test and in our PE practice. If we can just change the year 7, 8, 9, 10, or wherever you might do these multi-stage fitness tests, just if we can, again, boot beep test out of our vernacular because VCAR will not accept beep test as an answer for CI. Um, so perhaps if we start this early age, we just start calling it the 20-metre um, shuttle run, then we might have a bit more luck at that year 12 level where we don't have to teach them out of saying beep test. So multi-stage fitness test, 20-metre shuttle run. Both <laughs> did I, I got them both combined, did I? Yeah, sorry. No, both of them are okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right 9d um now luke you do some pretty good work in this space so we're going to get hand over to you with levers yeah perfect i think we're at 9a i've got listed down so we're talking about the the driver let me just read it out so in golf a driver which is a long club with a large striking head <laughs> can hit a golf ball further than a nine iron so we've got a driver and a nine iron um it's saying that we've got approximately the same mass so v be nice and and made that pretty clear same mass close enough to based on your understanding of biomechanical principles give two reasons uh, why the driver can hit the golf ball further uh, your response should include the how, how the following will impact performance we're looking at lever length and conservation momentum so they've given us that so i think the key here or something that i know Wooly said it before about isolating one um one component at a time in terms of biomechanics so with the volleyball if it says projectile motion just teach that or just teach impulse or whatever and i'm looking at the examiner's report here and a lot of people mention mass and because i find that people get this confusing where as we increase the lever length we know that we increase in theory the moment of inertia which is going to reduce our angular velocity because it's further away and all this stuff but it, it, that's two different concepts let's just focus on lever length first and then if it was applicable then you can talk about um, how a, a greater moment of inertia would reduce angular velocity. But they've been pretty nice here and just said that the mass is the same, okay? Maybe they could have said moment of inertia is the same, but even though that would be technically incorrect to make it super clear, but we're saying mass is the same, let's just focus on the lever length, okay? And I think the key here was that um, a longer lever is going to move further for the same angular change. So you move you know, 180 degrees, the longer lever is further away and therefore move a greater distance in the same time. The example I like to give here is, look, if you're running around an ath track and you're in lane one versus someone else in lane eight and you're actually both at the start line and you both finish that whole lap in the same time, clearly lane eight has gone a fair, fair bit further in terms of distance. So the longer lever is going to move faster. Um, so we wanted to, to make mention that both are third class levers they both have a mechanical advantage of less than one um if you, if you wanted to you could reference that the the longer lever has an even lower mechanical advantage but is therefore a speed multiplier it's a velocity multiplier and then it's essentially if you have the the same mass and you're applying force to the same mass but something is longer it's going to move faster and therefore same mass more velocity more momentum and therefore conservation of momentum it's going to impart momentum into the ball so the one that's going faster will will, will transform transfer more momentum to that golf ball and therefore it will be hit further because it's the same mass higher velocity more momentum transfer is essentially what they're after well said luke um you reminded me it's a difficult concept that longer lever travels a further distance um in the same amount of time um, one of the pracs that I will often get um, students to do is just to make a chain with their arms. And we can start with, you know, two or three students in a chain and they run around the inside person and they can do it quite easily. Then you put another person in the chain, another person in the chain, another person in the chain. So the chain gets to be, you know, like 10 students long. And you see this poor student on the outside of the chain 
having to really sprint to keep up with everybody until finally the chain breaks. It's a nice, fun way to show that the further away from the axis you get, mm. the greater the distance you have to go in the same amount of time and it becomes pretty hard. Yeah, I think it's a good one. It's, a, it's that same angular displacement, but it's a faster linear speed. The further away it is, it just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies more. And I think it would be a really tricky question if – if they did say the mass was different, because that's when you have to think about, oh, all right, if moment of inertia goes up, angular velocity goes down, so now they're not moving the same speed. That's where it gets tricky. But I don't think I've seen a question like that. Maybe I'll be wrong. If you Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. But yeah, you're going to either isolate one or the other, generally speaking. Longer lever, velocity advantage. So it should be able to move faster for yeah, the same that, that movement. That given us like a contract where we've had to yeah. explain biomechanical principles almost butting heads. Yeah, that happens in the real life, but I think, and I think this is how hopeful it will. Who knows? But hopefully, that's how how it continues yeah. as well. I think because I think the alternative question would be that you know a three year old kid picks up this cricket bat and it's too heavy. What do they do? And that's when we start talking about well, let's reduce the moment of inertia by bringing it closer to the the resistance closer to us, and therefore increasing angular velocity so it's easier to swing. But you're never gonna not never. I don't want to say never, but it would be tricky if you then had to relate that to um, less range of motion and speed potential would be a bit tricky. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. But the higher it, mate, the reason I say it, the higher end students they ask, they're like, well, hang on, wouldn't wouldn't the the driver be harder to swing if it because because that's what then they're saying that they mentioned mass here. Well, the moment of inertia would be greater, and it would be. But again, VK are trying to keep it simple and saying let's just say mass is the same. It's like saying let's talk about a diver leaving the platform and let's just forget air resistance. Let's totally forget about it because that's yeah. they're, they're not trying to make it too physicsy for us. Yeah, it's already difficult enough. Let's not make it uh, more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, now, I think we wanted to go to this question. This one. Yeah, 10C. And just quickly, this is 10C, um, four-mark question where they had to design a fart leg training session. Um, probably, like, this was a tough one to mark as well because some poor kids, like, under the pressure and probably spent about... 20 minutes designing this beautiful program that they thought was spot on and and um just it didn't one they were spending way too long on this question because they they were just overthinking it a little bit um and two they weren't quite nailing it because they weren't showing the things that we are marking this off which is basically frequency intensity time and type so fitt are great ways for us i think to perhaps teach our kids that if you are designing a training program, regardless of the fitness component that you are training, think FITT, what in how many times a week, what intensity, how long for, and what are we going to do? And, and that hopefully will make it easy. If, if the kids understand how we're going to mark it, hopefully they can understand how they should write their questions. And FITT is how we're going to mark something like this. One of the uh, aha, you know, aha moments that I had a few years ago when I was teaching was this FITT to create a program. Now, that's not the aha moment. The aha moment was, hang on, when I critique a program, I need to use FITT as well. When I evaluate a program, I need to use FITT as well. So um, we can be asked in the exam to create a program as per this um, question to critique a program as per the, the question that Willie went through earlier where you needed to signpost um, or evaluate a training program. And all three of those require you to refer to frequency, intensity, time, and type when you're answering those questions. Um, so we can simplify it for our students. And my, my, um, my tip in our SACs is to make sure that we not only ask our students to create programs, that we also ask them to critique a program as well. Um, and a lot of lot of students are not getting an opportunity to do that critique and evaluate programs in their SACs. I think that uh, covers all the burning questions that we had, gentlemen. Is there any uh, final thoughts or recommendations that you have for teachers in terms of what to to expect or what to do differently for two thousand and twenty three? Is there anything in, in particular that you want to to mention? Or are we happy to wrap it up? Oh, I, um... I'll go first, Stocky. You finish because you're the guru at all this, so you'll be able to finish it out well. But, like, one, everyone's doing an awesome job. Too. I think that's, that's always worth recognising that 
this is hard and, and certainly we hope you're not coming across as know-it-alls or anything like that. Like, this is hard. We're doing a great job. If you're listening to this, we're all learning. Um, so that's awesome. Performance links are crucial ways to finish. Um, there's that volleyball question that we've got to talk about. Um, be specific to the sport with those performance links. Um, please try and get our kids out of using terminology like as shown in the graph because we're missing still so many data marks across the board. And in this one, in this SAC, uh, sorry, in this exam, there's at least four where you have to explicitly mention data and a lot of like you're, you're dropping a lot of places through that. Um, but yeah, exam, just keep practicing that exam technique because that's a big part of this. But overall, um, we're doing it. We're doing a great job. We're doing our best and we just keep trying to get better. So well done. And everyone is doing as, as much as they possibly can. My tip would be that if we can find a way to teach these concepts outside um, on the oval, in the gym, um, try and do so. If you can't, bring some equipment into your class so that you can demonstrate with the sporting equipment and try and apply as many of these principles as you can um, with sporting equipment. These kids play sport they'll probably learn best through that sport. Um, and for me, this is a personal one for me, is I'm on a bit of a crusade to improve my interplay responses. Um, I don't think it's good enough that um, my students haven't improved over the last number of years. Um, so uh, I'm going to go to as many PDs as I can to try and uh, get some tips on how to improve interplay. And um, and that's where probably you come in, Luke, the, the ex uh fizz or the, the sports scientist because you guys have the most up-to-date information and you seem to have a pretty good way of explaining it so i'm going to learn as much as i can from as many people as many good people as i come across and i think that's a really good point to end on mate i think uh, if you're a new teacher or, or even you're just a, a single teacher at a, at, a, at a school and you've got no i guess support in the vcepe space is there are lots of people out there who are very um very generous generous with their time uh, no more than you two yourself at ABCPE, but um, network with with everyone, whether it's at a discovery conference or an ASHPA or a, um, or whatever it is. But in terms of, of my recommendation to anyone watching or listening to this, if you're not already following the ABCPE guys, you absolutely must do so. Um, they're putting out as much content as anybody else, more, more so than I am now, I'd, I'd say. They're, they're, they're going, I don't know how you have the energy to do it, you know, working full-time plus running free seminars for teachers, plus running free seminars for students you've got your exam revision you've got your sac resources you've got so much stuff out there um where where can people find you what do you recommend we you must get on their email list so how can we get on your email list i can even just put mate I'll, I'll copy and paste a link to say email this person if that's what they have to do but they're, they're always sending out lots of information so um soccer's woolly where should people go Thank you for the plug, mate. We've got a website, www.abcpe.com.au. Um, you can head there. You can sign up to our mailing list and get all the information on when we're hosting the free webinars. Um, we've got small group uh, tutoring. We call it our little PE Academy, where students who, um, who, who would like to be taught by us have an opportunity to be taught by us. Um, and that's a really cool little group that we do on a Wednesday and a Thursday night. So um, if you head there, all the information is on our website. But thanks for the plug, mate. Perfect, mate. We will put all the links to all, all of our recommended uh, actions in the show notes or in the description. So make sure you do go to the ABCP website and sign up to all that. Uh, guys, thank you. This is obviously a, a much longer podcast than we would normally do, but I think it warrants it based on it being the 2022 exam. Um, any questions, please let us know. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now. Thanks, mate.